Okay, so first, like, you know, the first few months of the war, I was all in, all in reserve, day in, day out. I didn't have any time to, to see the, med the media, at uh, least of all social media. But after things wind down a little bit, I opened my Instagram account and started to see what's happening all in the world. And I was sure, I and many Israelis were certain that after such a horrible attack, the world will be on our side. For once, we were the ones who were attacked. We didn't do anything. We didn't initiate anything. This was the greatest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. How could anyone not support us? And what I saw on the media baffled me. I saw so many people who started to blame the victims, to blame the Jews, to blame Israel. Ira, thank you so much for joining me. I know it's uh, late in Israel right now. It's early in the morning for me. Thank you so much for joining. I'm excited for you to be here. Thank you for having me, Ian. Me too. I'm excited. So uh, just to catch everyone up, we met when you were actually uh, touring the south of the United States, basically bringing mm -hmm. your experience um, on October 7th and post-October 7th to Americans who might not know too much about it. So before we dig into some of the details of your advocacy work and the months that have happened since, I'd love for you just to explain really what October 7th was like for you, your experience of it, and just really provide people with an insight into the truth about that day, the horrors of that day. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just generally about me, my name is Irma, I'm 30 years old, living in Tel Aviv. And uh, on October 7th, I was, you know, just living a normal life with my wife and my dog in a nice flat in uh, central Tel Aviv. Um, I, I work as a software engineer, you know, just a classical normal person you can find anywhere in the world. And then on, sa on Saturday morning, very early in the morning, I usually sleep in on Saturday, but 6.30 in the morning, we heard alarms and sirens. We had to run down to the shelter with all the building. It's like 20 people and eight dogs together underground. And we didn't know what happened. It's, it started off like, you know, just a, a normal round of war. But very quickly, we opened the TV and we understood that this is something very different. We had a lot of sirens the same day. And then we understood that someone is has passed into the border. And then, you know, it started to trickle down. You see some Instagram posts of people, some rumors uh, started to circulate about uh, terrorists crossing into Israel. And then by the end of the day, we understood that this is a massive event with hundreds of people killed and the photos from the Nova Music Festival already circulated. Many people were looking for their loved ones. You can see so many posts on social media. Have you seen him? He hasn't been contacted in the last few hours. And some of those are people that I know. And I was worried what happened to them. And it took days to figure out. Some of them uh, were found eventually. Some of them weren't. So that was like the first day. And, uh, you know, in Israel, uh, a lot of people, like it's mandatory to go to the army. And after you finish your, your army service, I finished it years ago, you're still kept in reserve. So I understood that this is a war, which means I have to go back to reserve. So my particular uh, role was technological. So I didn't go to the front line. But I had a very, very uh, rough days in the very few days of the war. I came immediately back to base, joined with all my unit, and we worked for weeks on end, day and night, to try and help the IDF do uh, uh, fare as better as possible, as best as possible in the war. And this is what we do. You know, we just leave in your entire social life behind. You tell your uh, boss, I'm not coming to work in the next month. I have to go to the army and help my old colleagues to do something which is more important. And everyone who didn't go to the reserve, for example, my wife, her unit didn't need her. She was a psychologist at the army. So she went volunteer. And I actually did the calculus, about 15% of the population of Israel immediately mobilized uh, when October 7th began. So the IDF itself tripled in size in one day. In one day, the army tripled in size. It actually became the third largest army in the world for a few weeks after the American and Russian only, American and Chinese, and, and everyone else, 10% of the population that didn't go to the, uh, to the reserve duty went on volunteer in civilian matters, you know, help all the Israeli refugees that had to flee their homes and try to donate blood, help as much as we can to the entire population. Mm -hmm. So how does that work? I know some people will be really interested to know, how does that work when you have such a sudden mobilization of so many people? I just imagine in the United States, right, if we just took 15% of the workforce, clicked your fingers and they were doing something else, everything would just shut down. So is that more of a, a normal expectation in Israel? Like are people more prepared for that? Like how do businesses, is everyone supportive? Is everyone just on the same side in that way? Or is there some pushback? Like some people have to kind of get permission to go or is it just an expectation that 
15 percent of the workforce one day might just need to go do something else mm -hmm. so especially people who are in active reserve who know that mm -hmm. the unit is important their boss has to know they, okay. their, their boss knows you can uh, you can employ this person but if there's a war he's going to be needed and some people have been in reserve for 200 300 days which means like they've been in reserve more than they've done anything else and it, this is this is an expectation in israel uh, you need to know that you're, when the, the entire nation is dependent on you you have to to come back to reserve and i can tell you that especially in this war sometimes you know when it's like a small operation sometimes people might not want to go to reserve or they maybe someone just started a business and he doesn't want to go to war right now maybe he just had a a, a boy had a child he wants to take care of he doesn't want to leave his wife or his partner alone but in this war, we had amazing turnout. We had like 150% turnout in many bases. People had to be turned away because there wasn't physically place. There wasn't a physical place in the bases to accommodate them because everyone wanted to, to support the war and everyone understood that this is really an existential uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the days afterwards. So um, quite a few months after um, you sort of re-enlisted in the reserves, met you in America when you were traveling the South mm -hmm. to tell everyone about the experience of October 7th and everything that happened afterwards. So what was that like for you? What was that experience like? Were you surprised in a positive way, in a negative way? Just would love to hear about your experience. Okay, so first, like, you know, the first few months of the war, I was all in all in reserve, day in, day out. I didn't have any time to to see the, med the media, at least of all social media. Mm -hmm. But after things wind down a little bit, I opened my Instagram account and started to see what's happening all in the world. And I was sure, I and many Israelis who were certain that after such a horrible attack, the world will be on our side. For once, we were the ones who were attacked. We didn't do anything. We didn't initiate anything. This was the greatest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. How could anyone not support us? And what I saw on the media baffled me. I saw so many people who started to blame the victims, to blame the Jews, to blame Israel. And the worst of all, those are not just, you know, Islamic relics, uh, uh, clerics or, you know, Islamic uh, uh, jihadist extremists who hate us anyway. Those are people who look like me. People, you know, from the liberal world, those so-called progressive side, people who should support human rights, should support uh, anti-discrimination. And there they are siding with horrible jihadists and people who would throw them off roofs or decapitate them without a second thought. This was really baffling to me. Mm -hmm. So I started to look into this phenomena, what, what causes it. And what I found is ignorance. Ignorance, ignorance, ignorance. People just have no idea what's going on. And that's the only way uh, a liberal person would hate Israel is if he's just uninformed or misinformed or disinformed or all three combined. So I really wanted to change that and do as much as I can to, you know, to, to tell the Israeli story, to show people what's really going on here. And that's why I started my, uh, my following. And uh, the Come back to your question, coming back to coming to America, meet the people of uh, Alabama and Tennessee it was an amazing experience because the people there are very, very supportive. And like the, the most common question, I was willing to face difficult question, but the most common question was, how can we best support you? And this really shows you, you know, sometimes the media make it look like everyone hates Israel and the, the vast majority of people are not supportive. But uh, you can see when you meet people face to face or when you do large scale polling or when you do elections, you can see that the vast majority, like the, the peaceful majority, is supportive of Israel, is against uh, radical extremists and jihadis. And, um, and it's, it's a very good thing to see for, for yourself. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's the thing that's very encouraging. Like, I've driven around rural Tennessee and there's Israel flags everywhere that like you would never expect, right? And you, know, mm -hmm. always, you hear hit stereotypes about the South and in the vast majority of cases, they're simply not true. And the racism I see and the bigotry and the anti-Semitism are in urban areas they're in highly educated college campuses it's really the opposite of what you'd expect and so yeah. when you were um so in the us you didn't experience a lot of that but obviously doing a lot of your ag advocacy on social media you probably see almost every single type <clears throat> of anti-israel anti-semitic lie how has that battle been was it um i know it's something you know every jew has seen in their life this isn't like the first time we've seen anti-semitism but was this like on another level post october 7th for you online mm -hmm. So yeah, it was really something I never experienced uh, myself. You know, anti-Semitism exists online, has always existed, but this is really something on, on a whole new level. I'm going to quote to you one of the messages I got. You might have to beep it out, so okay. you won't be blocked on some of the platforms. There's a person who wrote to me on like a on a, on a, on a DM on Instagram, 
And this was the message. You dirty Jew. I hope you burn to death in a gas chamber, dirty Jew. This was the, the response, you know, for me, like criticizing Hamas on a video. And I, I was always wondering how to address these kind of people. Maybe you can block, maybe you can ignore. But I decided to uh, engage and talk to the person. Eventually, it turns out it was just a teenager from Sri Lanka. He didn't know anything about anything. And just a little bit of conversation, a little bit of, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, talk, even though it was just text on the, on the uh, Instagram DM. He changed his mind completely. He said he was praying for peace, praying for the return of the hostages, and all he wants is peace in the world. And then he also, um, when I told him, please don't go and tell Jews to burn in gas chambers. It's very offensive. So he said, okay, and he deleted his message. And I have <laughs> a few more interactions like that. He starts with absolute, vile, despicable hate. And uh, at least if the other side understands basic English, this is not always the case, you can make him change his mind pretty quickly. I even had a, an, an example from a guy from Iran started to send me some Iranian propaganda and he didn't respond to English messages. So I used Google Translate, started to talk to, uh, to him in, in Farsi. And eventually he turned around. He said, yes, I know that my regime is evil. I'm sorry for what happened to you. All we want is peace. So it's usually very easy just using a personal connection mm -hmm. to turn people around, especially from those edges of extremism. I think that's what's so fascinating is the ignorance that underlies it all. Because when you've actually, you have some people out there who are, almost genuinely hateful, right? They've, they've spent a lot of their life building up these viewpoints, but then you've got a lot of the people you meet on college campuses and the people you see online who are so confident in their hatred, but you scratch the surface and there's, there's nothing there. They're, they, they're almost that there's no connection between the hate they have and the actual view they have. Because once you get to the views, it's like, oh, well, I want peace. I like liberal values. I like equal <laughs> rights. It's like, well, okay, why are you supportive of Hamas? and not supportive of Israel, like the entire world is upside down. It, it's really bizarre to see. Mm -hmm. It is, and I also I can tell you another experience I had in, uh, in, you know, in Ann Arbor, in Michigan, University of Michigan, mm -hmm. one of the most uh, liberal, like a, a left-wing uh, stronghold. I went inside the, uh, the Palestine encampment, the Gaza encampment inside the campus. I just asked people, like, you know, can you explain why are you here? Why are you protesting? What is your goal here? And then one student came up to me and she said, I can explain, I know, like with confidence. Mm -hmm. The reason we're protesting against Israel is because Israel is a colony that was created by the United States in order to steal the oil under Gaza. Mm -hmm. That was like her, her motivation. And it just baffled me the amount, the sheer ignorance of that. What oil? What America? I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> absolutely nothing to do with reality. And just a few minutes of conversation, she said, ah, wow, Judea actually comes from Jews. Ah, 20% of the population of Israel are Arabs. I didn't know that. That's interesting. And just, you know, try to make them do this very, very simple step of Googling something. And, you know, questioning the very basic assumptions of what they've been taught. This, I think, is the best way towards understanding and eventually, you know, a more nuanced and sane approach to this conflict. So what advice do you have for people who are trying to do what you're doing, right? Which is have these conversations. So I'd love to go through just some of the examples you've had of, precisely the lies you've come across and how to debunk them. So the one I hear a lot is going to be Israel was created in 1948 out of nowhere, right? America just came along, clicked their fingers, created Israel. And that plays into the lie that Israel is just a tool of Western colonialism, blah, blah, blah. Um, mm -hmm. What are the lies you've come across most? And what's the most effective way? I know you've said, you know, having these conversations, but I think some people would love to be armed with precisely, you know, the tools, precisely the counter arguments really the truth mm -hmm. of how to deal with these things because i speak with college students all the time who want to have these conversations um mm -hmm. but it's hard because they if someone pushes back and you're not armed with the full truth and the deep truth it could be quite difficult right because these people are intimidating they can be aggressive they can really push back and so i would love just to hear your advice to those people on what are the core truths you need to understand to have these conversations mm -hmm. so first of all in general it's a good idea to arm yourself with knowledge and now knowledge is highly accessible. You know, my account is one such account. I do 15 seconds videos where I explain one topic at a time. So it's very approachable, very easy to understand. There are many good accounts, social accounts of Israelis. Follow Israelis online. Now they are more accessible than, than ever. And the, the, the information is accessible. And you should also know that a lot of the Palestinian propaganda, they use a very specific kind of propaganda, which I label propaganda by omission. It means they just tell you their side of the story and completely leave out the rest of it. I, I have an example how to show how potent a strategy this is, just imagine 
like a, a German person trying to justify World War II ju during a propaganda bio mission. This would sound something like that. Uh, the German people have lived on their nation, in their land for thousands of years until one day uh, evil white colonialist Europeans came and invaded Germany, killed millions of its people, uh, ethnically cleansed them out of their land and, and brutally executed their democratically elected leaders. Now, all of this is true. All of the, what I just said is exactly true. What I left out is why this happened mm -hmm. and you know, the entire context that you know. But had you not know anything about World War II or what the Germans did, you might, you know, want to grab a Nazi flag and go march in, the, in, in Madison Square Garden. So what you need is context. I'll give you just a few examples which are very similar to this example. So like the Nakba, the great story of the Nakba, they say 700,000 uh, Arabs had to flee their homes because of Israel's creation. But first of all, this war was, was launched by the Arabs in order to kill every single Jew. This was their stated aim. They call it to sweep the Jews to the sea. They had a genocidal aim. They wanted to kill all the Jews. They failed. And the result of that was a loss of land. So who started the war? The Arabs, all wars. Another example of counter-argument, oh, okay, maybe 700,000 Arabs lost uh, their land during that time, but at the exact same time, a million Jews lost uh, their land. They're actually a bigger loss of land because a million Jews from the Muslim countries around the world also had uh, to flee their home. So it was a population exchange, which was, again, skewed towards the Arabs. The Arabs lost, uh, less people lost their homes, and their homes were far less valuable than what the, the Jewish uh, population has lost. And again, at the exact same time that we had this population exchange in Israel, you had 15 million people in India and Pakistan, 10 times bigger, the exact same story, a population exchange, because the British partitioned the land in a bad way. But no one talks about it. No one ever mentions the, uh, that. No one says we should destroy India because they kicked out some of their Muslims doing a war, which the Muslims started. So th this is like some of the, of the biggest examples. Another example is the, the lie that Gaza is somehow occupied by Israel. Now, Gaza is not occupied by Israel. It used to be under Israeli military control, but almost 20 years ago, Israel ethnically cleansed its own people and took everything it has from Gaza outside. And ever since, there is no military presence in Israel, in a Israeli military presence in Gaza. So if Israel is occupying Gaza, it means that Egypt is also occupying Gaza. A lot of people don't understand that Gaza has a border with Egypt. So if Israel even wanted, it cannot control what goes in and out of Gaza because of the Egyptian border. Right? Or at least before October 7, which changed everything. And this is some of the biggest misconceptions. I can go on and on if you want. Oh, I mean, I think that's, that's the key thing is that people don't understand the basics. They don't understand the basics of geography or basic history. Or I think the most important thing you said is the lies by omission, because as you said, it's very easy to twist any historical event in one mm -hmm. way or the other if you just ignore half of the story. And I think that's the biggest problem, even with October 7th is in the days afterwards, I think in, in the United States, I think on October 7th, there were people celebrating what happened. Obviously, that's horrific to see. But the vast majority of people who are kind of the middle saw that and were horrified and that they weren't making excuses or anything like that. But it was in the immediate days afterwards that then the, the lies by omission came in. It's like, well, yes, these rapes happen, but then they were focusing on the butt a little more. You know, they were focusing on, well, what drove people to this? You know, you had very high profile writers essentially arguing and, and political commentators and politicians and activists all arguing that, well, these people were driven to this. You know, Palestinians were driven to this. Yes, they did terrible things, but look what they were forced to do by the Israelis. Everything always comes back to, well, you can blame the Jews ultimately. I think that's the key thing I try and get through to people is, if you understand this level of anti-Semitism that is always there, this double standard where you always blame the Jews, you blame them for being victimized and as victimizers, then it doesn't really matter what direction you come at this as, whether it's ignorance or hatred or anything, you end up in the same spot, which is, it's so powerful, it's crazy. Yeah, victim blaming is a very strong ve uh, weapon against the Jews. It's always like that. They always blame Israel. And this really shows, I really, this is something that actually changed my mind about this war and about the perception of Israel in the world. Because I thought that, you know, acting benevolently and being nicer towards the Arab and, and maybe even taking huge risks on our security and our safety is something that will improve Israel's image in the world. Like getting out of Gaza. I personally supported it. 20 years ago, there were manifestations, protests in the street. My family and I, we went to protest for this because we thought, mm -hmm. okay, let's give them what they say they want. They want, uh, you know, a land which is free of Jews, uh, Juden Rhine land to live on. So we'll give it to them and then we will have peace. Then we won't have war. They won't attack us. And just reality shows that no, if we give them more land, they just attack us even stronger. 
and that doesn't and, and the sympathy is never with, with us it's always with the other side and if you say that Gaza attacked Israel because of the so-called blockade which is a complete lie there was no such thing why did Lebanon attack why did Yemen attack I mean are they all occupied is the entire world occupied what does Iran want from us I mean it's the other side of the world basically thousands of miles away why are they all attacking and the basic question the basic answer to that is they don't want Jews to have any rights at all in the past they didn't want Jews to have civil rights or personal rights now they don't want them to have a national rights which is to live in their ancestral homeland and this is the main sticking point this is the only explanation it's just plain and pure hatred toward the Jewish people and an attempt to strip them of any kind of right or human essence mm-hmm. what's always blows people's minds I found is whenever they talk about you know the colonization or the empire if you do the basic comparison of how many Muslim countries there are to how many Jewish countries or how many Muslims there are to Jews or just the num like the square mm-hmm. miles comparison again yeah, ignorance people have ignorance. no idea 99.6 percent of the Middle East is occupied by Muslim and Arab this is the fact Israel is less than half a percent of Of the Middle East and, you know, and the, like you know if you go into like some people say Israel only wants more land look at this uh, smotrich or this bank or this extreme uh, uh, or this extreme uh, uh, right-wing minister mm-hmm. supposedly in Israel and you inside Israel of course it's a democracy so there's a spectrum of opinion mm-hmm. but the spectrum of opinion is whether Israel should have 0.4 percent of the Middle East or 0.5 percent of the Middle East <laughs> but this is the, the maximalist extreme white wing they said no we should have half a percent of the Middle East And the Arabs, you know, in their view, the, 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 the entire spectrum of opinion is whether they should have 100% of the Middle East or 100% of the world. Yeah. This is like the, the spectrum over there. Where do you think we go next from this? Because I know, especially with the election in the United States, a lot of eyes are going to be on foreign policy. We saw a lot of this, I think, can be blamed on a lot of the political decisions in the United States. For example, a lot of enabling Iran and funding Iran or in, allowing Iran to become a regional power again. What do you think are the next steps like both in the context of American policy but also just Israeli policy because something I get asked all the time when I go on college campuses is, is you know what should Israel do do you think Israel's doing the right thing um, which is I feel a little uncomfortable answering because you know I'm not Israeli and so it's sort of I, I don't feel like I can talk about American policy because you know I live in America and that's what I'm involved in that's the policy I'm involved in uh, so I'd be really interested in hearing what do you think Israeli policy should be moving forward? And where do you think we go from here? Like, what are the, the long-term outcomes of this? Mm-hmm. So I'll kind of divide my answer into two. So there is like, you know, the, the on-the-ground policy, what you should do like militarily, and then the mm-hmm. long-term political solution. So uh, first, I'll start to say that if you criticize Israel, you have to understand that Israel has done more than any other army in the world in order to safeguard the lives of enemy civilians. Something you can read all about it, you know, uh, just... tell the, the, the civilians to go away before the attack, specific warnings for every building that exists, personally calling a person on the ground to tell him, hey, you need to move, we are about to bomb. Things that no other army has ever done, really. Israel is raising the moral standards of war, which is causing a problem for other Western armies because they cannot keep up with these moral standards. Now, so about this, I really can't take any criticism about the moral conduct because I think it's above and beyond the, the humanitarian law and international law of war. Uh, regarding what needs to be done on the ground, The problem is that the militants and the population are mixed. This is the MO of Hamas. They are mixing themselves with the population. So the only thing that can be done to finally vanquish Hamas and destroy them militarily is to separate them from the population. This is what Israel is trying to do right now in northern Gaza. You set up a, a proper a checkpoint, let all the civilians out, out of the, uh, um, the dangerous area, then destroy what remains of Hamas inside this area. And after that, you can reconstitute some kind of a uh, local power, some kind of governance and bring back the population. This is what should be done. The, sh- the Gaza Strip should be emptied of civilians, you know, every single part of it. Like you take a chunk of territory, get the civilians to a safer place outside of it, deal with Hamas and then bring the civilians back. And then you can have a military uh, rule inside that will be free of Hamas. After that, after eliminating Hamas, which is a prerequisite to any kind of uh, peaceful mm-hmm. Um, process we have to bring someone back so what will it be it could be for a, a short period of time an Israeli uh, military but eventually it should be some kind of political entity which will be governed by Palestinians maybe independent uh, Gaza administration maybe some part or some change in the Palestinian Authority which has a lot of problems in itself 
and needs to do major reforms before it can do that. Maybe some kind of other international body, but it cannot be uh, Hamas and it should not be uh, Israel. This is about Gaza and the conflict there. Eventually, the only way to actually achieve long uh, standing peace in the Middle East is to deal with Iran. We have to deal with Iran because this is the elephant in the room. They are the biggest state sponsor of terrorism in the entire world. So as long as this regime exists, this is what they do. This is their uh, raison d'etre. What they want to do is to sponsor terrorism, create chaos, and take over the Middle East. So the only way to deal with them is very, very severe sanctions and a credible military uh, threat against both their uh, nuclear facilities and their conventional um, arms uh, depots. And how do we do you think um, Israel should handle the fact that there is just like deep anti-Semitic hatred within the Palestinian population? Because I think that's something that people, I think there is nuance there, right? Because there is a, there is anti-Hamas sentiment among Palestinians that doesn't get a lot of attention, but there's also far more support among Palestinians for groups like Hamas than people are willing to admit. Like quite often when you speak about it in um, places like America, it's always, well, Hamas is the problem. A lot of Palestinians just want to live in peace. Now, there are Palestinians who want to live in peace, but there's also Palestinians who openly support Hamas, work alongside Hamas. On October 7th, some Palestinian civilians joined Hamas and broke through the border and committed just horrendous acts of violence. And so what's the long-term plan there? Because I, d I don't think it's just a matter of Hamas. I think you're absolutely right that Hamas is a prerequisite for any progress beyond that. But how do we deal with that level of just like deep hatred for Israel and also just Jews that is there on a generational level because you get rid of Hamas this isn't an argument against getting rid of Hamas, but you get rid of Hamas as another group is going to take that play, their place. Of course, you have to keep fighting them, but a path to peace can't just involve a constant terrorist group at the head of it. So how do you think we deal, if we can deal, with just that level of hatred that seems to be there on a generational level? Mm -hmm. So in the long run, in the long run, it is possible to have a de uh, campaign, you know, like the de nazification after World War II a lot of education and we can take good example from countries like the UAE which recently amended their curriculums and their schools they have educators they actually know how to do de-radicalization de in a Muslim society just to promote a more tolerant version of Islam and I actually think the UAE is a great example for that I wish all Muslim countries would be like the UAE a great example uh, on a side note I have to say something which you know might not sound so well to some liberal uh, ears in the in the West but the thing is that the the countries in the Middle East are not democracies. They are far mm -hmm. from it. Actually, the worst, the, the least democratic country on the planet is, I think, Syria right now, which is a neighbor to Israel. So what the population believes has relatively little implication to what the government does. You can see the example of uh, Jordan and Egypt. The population there hates Israel completely, viscerally. Um, but we have sustainable peace with those nations. And on the other side, you can see in Lebanon and also in uh, Iran, that the majority of the population is not against Israel. In Iran, actually, I think one of the most pro-Israeli populations in the Middle East. Uh, but because the government mm -hmm. is against Israel, they are attacking us nonetheless. So unfortunately, until the Middle East will be a haven of democracy like Europe or America, we will have to deal with government and not the population itself. And the, the opinion of the government is much more important than the, you know, the men on the street. That's really interesting. On the level of um, the government stuff, what's been the Israeli impression of the American um, election and uh, Donald Trump winning? Has there been, I I'm sure that it's across the spectrum, right? Because you have just mm -hmm. the biggest political spectrum, I think, in all Western countries in Israel. It's politically very chaotic. I find it very hard to keep up with. What's been your opinion of the general um, perception of that and in, in the context of American policy towards Israel? Mm -hmm. So yeah, like you said, Israel is a very diverse democracy. Like America, we have the entire spectrum and people have their opinions. Wherever you go, you'll find, you know, two, two Jews, three opinions. That's uh, also the same, yeah. uh, the same case uh, about um, American elections. In general, people have to understand, sometimes people judge because Israel is like a very pro-Trump uh, country. You can see like in, uh, in polls before the election, uh, Trump got 66% of support in Israel, a lot more than, uh, than Kamala. And I think this is kind of justified because unlike Americans, which are mostly affected by the domestic policy of the president, you know, things like abortion or, or you know, rule of law, which kind of are less popular with the uh, Republican uh, candidate. In Israel, we are mostly affected by the foreign policy. So this is what we, we judge the president uh, by. 
I mean, if there's a more or less a right to abortion, it, you know, it could affect me on a moral level on what I, I believe is true, but it does not affect my life as much as uh, munitions, mm-hmm. you know, and the, the policy towards Iran. And I believe that a lot of the problems in Gaza and also in the wars in Lebanon were caused by a support which is, you know, half-hearted towards Israel. And uh, like the amazing thing that when Israel was about to go into Rafa, you know, when we found uh, three living hostages, six murdered hostages, Sinwar himself, and so many terrorist infrastructure. So Israel had to go into Rafa. But when we said we were going to do that, suddenly, uh, you know, there was a, a halt in munition and intense pressure. So relieving this pressure and allowing Israel to finally do what needs to be done, I think it will be better for Israel, of course, but it will also be better for the Palestinians because this war is already dragging itself almost a year and a half. And it could have been so much easier and so much faster if we would do, you know, it's like a band-aid. You have to pull it fast, not drag it on for months or years. You have to just do what needs to be done, even though it has some short-term bad uh, repercussions. Eventually, this will be the only way to achieve a long-standing peace and uh, coexistence with the Palestinians in Gaza. And what do you think American policy should be more specifically regarding Israel? Do you think it should be more of a, you know, support ideologically, pressure on Iran, but otherwise hands off militarily? Um, or do you think there should be some American involvement? Because like my, I get asked this all the time. And my opinion is that I don't think Israel needs American involvement on the ground. I think you can do a lot of intelligence sharing and technology sharing, like working on the Iron Dome, things like that. Um, but I think that the key thing for me is, I agree with you, is the focus on Iran. If, if the United States can remove Iran in terms of making them a regional power, then I think a lot of these other problems go away. All these problems are sort of sub problems of Iran. And so if we focus on Iran, that'll solve it. But I'd be interested to in hearing your view on any other policies or any specific involvement, because that's a question for me that comes up a lot. Mm-hmm. So yeah, first, what you said, Iran is the root of all problems in the Middle East. The moment you deal with Iran, the, all, the, all, all the other problems will diminish uh, immensely and very, and very fast. So th- this, this fact, this understanding needs to dawn on the American uh, um, policymakers. And, uh, and also, sometimes Americans really like to de-escalate the situation. You know, they don't want... The same in Ukraine. You don't want to give them long-range missiles. You don't want the, the, the wide war to erupt mm-hmm. or a, a regional war. But this is a regional war. The situation has escalated. This is the problem because also a lot of people, not only in the American administration, but in the American public, do not understand that a war or a conflict has two sides. And Israel can only choose what it does. If the other side wants our complete obliteration, there is nothing we can do about it, right? Mm-hmm. We can, you know, scale down and stop fighting, but they will not stop fighting. So this has to be put into consideration that the other side is also active here. And sometimes in order to de-escalate, you have to escalate. So you have to attack Iran. You have to neutralize their uh, ballistic missiles capability. Also, of course, their nuclear uh, capabilities. And you have to do it with very, very strong sanctions and also a credible military threat. This is the, the, the only way uh, to move forward. About if America should dictate policy to Israel, so in general, it's a good idea you know, to say what you think and, and, and to show uh, what, what you believe in. Um, but you also have to understand the situation on the ground and the fact that like, America gives Israel a lot of weapons, you know, a lot of uh, precise munitions, and it really helps the, the fight. But then you don't allow uh, an evacuation of population. You know, mm-hmm. it's like American... I heard this administration, the outgoing administration, they said they are not willing to allow for the, the so-called general's plan, which means, you know, the temporary evacuation of civilians from a war zone in Gaza in order to clear out Hamas. But there's no other way. There's no, there's no mm-hmm. other option. No, and sometimes they, they say things that really baffles me. I remember I, I heard the many government officials in, in the administration a few months ago, they said that Israel has no viable plan. Uh, how to evacuate Rafa? You know, I've heard it so many times. There's no way to evacuate all the civilians. It's absolutely impossible. A million and a half people. You know what happened eventually? The IDF spokesperson launched a tweet. Hey, civilians, please move a little bit to the north. Two miles, yeah? Not too much. We're coming into Rafa. They did it. And mm-hmm. Rafa had the least civilian casualties of all other areas in Gaza. So sometimes, I mean, I feel like the, Amer- the American administration, they kind of lack imagination and lack, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the audacity. You have to do things that haven't been done before if you want to get uh, you know, solutions that weren't existent before. And the constant push to a ceasefire, I think it's a wrong thing to do because Israel had six ceasefires with Hamas. Mm-hmm. They broke each and every one of them. Israel had a ceasefire 
uh, on October 6th, and Hamas broke it. So there's a quote, uh, probably falsely attributed to uh, Einstein, that says that uh, the definition of insanity is to do the exact same thing and expect different results. If you want a different result, if you want a long-standing peace, you have to do things differently. I think it's interesting you brought up the comparison with Ukraine as well, because that's something that is very strange in the United States, is that I feel like Israel has become the Republican war and Ukraine has become the Democrat war. Because if you took the Biden and the Kamala Harris administration and you compared their view of both wars, Ukraine can do no wrong, right? They're just constantly sending money, constantly sending weapons. They just okayed the use of long range US missiles in Russia, which seems like a pretty outrageous escalation. A lot of people are very critical of, especially at the end of an administration when you know they're leaving in a few weeks. But then with Israel, they were constantly holding their feet to the fire, demanding a ceasefire, even though one side didn't want a ceasefire, demanding a hostage deal, even though one side didn't want to release hostages. It was always this constant pressure. I feel like some of this was because of the election of like Kamala Harris was trying to win over Jews and Muslims at the same time. And she failed with both because she was running you know, commercials for both sides, and they were obviously um, counterintuitive. But do you think that is indicative of a wider problem, like across Europe and across the world, of just viewing Ukraine and Israel and Gaza and Hamas as completely different situations, when in many ways, they're similar, right? And I see a lot of the people who support Ukraine are so anti-Israel. And I just, I don't understand it. Because you see people like, yeah, you've got to defeat Russia. But then you talk about defeating Hamas, and people get very uncomfortable. Why can't we defeat evil? I, I don't understand. Yeah, I completely agree. I also remember during the, the only debate between Trump and Harris, like the moderator asked them, do you want to see Ukraine win? So Kamala said, yes, I want to see them defeat uh, Russia. And Trump said, I want the war to end. Mm -hmm. come, he does that the exact opposite. Kamala yeah. Harris says, I want the war to end. And Trump said, they have to finish the job, like a completely different uh, you know, nomenclature. And I actually think, yeah, this is the exact same war, Israel and Ukraine. And those are actually two of the three uh, fronts that now exist in the, I don't want to call it World War III, but you know, the current big, big crisis mm -hmm. in the world. And the third uh, front is, of course, Taiwan. And all of those are the same. And we're going to see a war in Taiwan probably in the, in the next decade, maybe even before. And th this is the exact same evil in, in, very, in, in varied fronts. We've seen, you know, uh, Russian weapons and Chinese weapons inside Gaza and inside Lebanon. And we've seen Iranian weapons uh, attacking cities in in uh, in Ukraine. So when Israel bombs a, a, a drone facility in in Iran, of course it also helps Ukraine because the mm -hmm. same drones that are killing Israelis are also killing Ukrainians. It's, it's the exact same same war, just different fronts of it. And I, I am baffled by the fact that people you know view this uh, so differently. And uh, the same it's really the same story because there's an aggressor, Russia, China, and uh, Hamas that started a war unprovoked. For no reason, but the stated aim of completely obliterating the enemy, right? Russia's mm -hmm. stated aim is to destroy Ukraine, make it not exist anymore. This is the stated aim of Hamas to take off, to take all of Israel, and exactly the same thing in China. They don't recognize Taiwan as a country. So this is against a war with three fronts, uh, launched by a non-democratic, brutal, and uh, obliteratory, if that's a word. Yeah. Uh, force that wants to destroy its its democratic enemy, and the West needs to you know to pick up the pace and start supporting the the right side of history. I think a lot of it is also it's two things. I think one is naivety of just not understanding the the truth about these kind of regimes, but I also think it's just not understanding violence because I think a lot of the West. Europe, but especially the United States, hasn't seen violence like a lot of the rest of the world has. Um, obviously, these countries have gone to war, but it's been a war in the other side of the world. And so unless you are actively engaged in these wars, you don't really understand the, the horror of violence and how real and how raw and how present it is. And so something like the war in Ukraine, something like the war in Gaza, or even Taiwan, it's so far away. I think a lot of people just don't see it as particularly important or threatening. Uh, I think there's a there's some kind of racial element here where I think a lot of people in the West look at Ukraine and it's quote unquote white versus white. And so I don't think they care. But when they look at the Middle East, that gets more complicated because a lot of people are obsessed with race in the West. And so they see white versus brown, even though Israel is not white. And so they look at it a completely different way. Um, but they don't see the fact that there are, as you said, these actual empires that are looking to expand influence, push an evil ideology but it's so far away, it doesn't matter. And my concern is that they don't wake up to it until it's too late. 
until Europe is slowly taken over by this ideology, until the United States doesn't have trade influence that is us, until we lose the semiconductor industry, which basically all technology you know, relies on. I think it's the naivety and it's the, the, the weakness that comes from being safe for too long, right? Israel is constantly surrounded by a threat. And so people grow up understanding the reality of a threat. The United States is still, I'd say, the safest country in the world to live in in terms of external threats. And I, I, that, that's great. But I also think it breeds a feeling of not understanding what a threat is and what you can do about it. And I think that drives our policy. And so I, I, that's what I try and get through to people is the understanding of the reality of evil, the reality of violence and the reality of military threat. Um, but sometimes, unfortunately, it takes people to see that face to face before they wake up to it. And usually that's too late. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. And the same thing can be also said about Israel, despite the fact that we're surrounded by enemies. We've had a few years of peace and no one expected mm -hmm. anything like this. So let, let me say, let me give a poignant message to the viewers in the West. Total and uh, existential war is not upon you until it is mm -hmm. one day, whether it's October 7th or February 24th in Ukraine. And every Ukrainian will, you know, will reiterate what I say. You can have a normal life, live in your cozy Western uh, um, a Western and lavish uh, lifestyle, and then the siren starts, and then you are bombed, and nothing like that ever happened to you or to your parent or maybe even to your grandparents. But one day the war will come, and it will be sudden, and it will be brutal, and I don't wish it upon anyone, but you have to understand that this can happen. You just wake up, and the siren is in your streets, and the bombs are falling, and people are dying, and if you only realize that then, and only then start to fight, really might be too late it's just it's the kind of thing that you hope some no one ever has to actually learn right but it's a lesson that people have been learning for all of human history and so unfortunately it's a matter of time regardless of where you live uh, one last question i wanted to get to but this is going to be for subscribers only so if you want to hear ira's um, answer on my last question please head over to my sub stack ira thank you so much for coming on it's a pleasure to talk to you i'm looking forward to everything you do next to try and fight the good fight thank you so much